Good evening, I'm Madeline Peel, and I'm the moderator for Community Board 8 Speaks. And this evening we have a rather remarkable show because uh, it's remarkable because it's something we all need. And what is that? Housing. Uh, housing is something we all need, and we're going to talk this evening about inclusionary zoning and its impact on affordable housing. And uh, there isn't one person in New York who doesn't think that housing should be affordable. And many of us pay more than uh, what the, the standard is, which is a quarter of their income. Some people in New York are paying more than half of their income for their housing. And we all know this is a very expensive town to live in, and so we're going to have a great panel this evening, uh, professors and practitioners of real estate who will be uh, introduced to us by our housing chair, Anka Pope, who is uh, with Community Board 8 as well, and we will have a wonderful discussion. My name is Nika Pope, and I am chairperson of the housing committee on Community Board 8. I tell you, nothing happens unless we have the support of our elected officials, a couple of whom are here right now, and we're going to get to them in just one moment. But I want you to know that they have been extremely supportive um, of the forum, have co-sponsored the forum, and we're extremely lucky to have elected officials um, who care so much about affordable housing issues in this city. Um, and beginning with the Manhattan Borough President, C. Virginia Fields, um, uh, Gifford Miller, our city council person, uh, Pete Granis, Jonathan Bing, our assembly people, uh, our city council person, Eva Moskowitz, who's going to be speaking in just a moment, and also um, our, wow, I'm getting it mixed up, Liz. <laughs> uh, our assembly member, assembly member? State Senator. State Senator. State Senator. Liz, Liz Kruger. Oh, thank you. Hi, Liz Kruger. I'm very glad to be here. Um, Liz comes from Liz. Well, out there. Yeah. Are you implying I'm short? No, 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 I am no, short. I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody. And I'm looking forward to hearing the panelists. Brad is an old friend, and inclusionary zoning um, is one of the critical issues we have to deal with. Um, as a state legislator, I will tell you that I'm extremely frustrated with the failure of the state of New York to come up with not only any help for New York City and our housing crisis for decades, but in fact that New York State government, in my opinion, has been part of the problem as opposed to part of the solution. So if I was going to do one appeal tonight to people who care about housing, because you're, or, you're all here, is join me and others in the legislature and in the housing advocacy community in calling for this year New York State Legislature to repeal the Erstat law yes. and put the decision making about housing policy in New York City back into the hands of elected officials. So a little pressure on everyone. Everyone running for mayor, you're supposed to move to get a home rule message to Albany that we should repeal the Erstat law. If the city council and the mayor of New York City, and some of those people in the city council want to be the mayor. Some of those people in borough presidencies want to be the mayor. We could be even handed here. Some people who are the mayor want to stay the mayor. Oh, well, sorry, one person who's the mayor wants to stay the mayor. First that law, sure. Um, we need a repeal of a law called the Erstat Law, named after a guy named Erstat, an unusual name, um, from, from the early 70s, and that law took power from the city of New York to make our own decisions over housing policy, over tenant protections, over Mitchell Lama, over rent stabilization, over rent control, took the power from elected officials in New York City and shifted it to the state government. And very simply, the reason New York City should make its own housing policy, because people from Rensselaer County and Niagara Falls and Erie don't know anything about the problems of housing in New York City, the issues of affordability, or the solutions that could work for New York City. Now, Eva Moskowitz, 
please come on up. Thank you so much for coming. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much. And I want to thank Community Board Age and our panelists for participating in this incredibly important uh, forum. I'm sure you saw in the Times today that apartments in Manhattan uh, are going past the million dollar mark. Uh, it is becoming a, a borough and a city of have and have nots. Uh, and affordable housing, in my mind, is uh, the number one issue. Um, and this city uh, really has not had uh, a, uh, an affordable housing strategy in 20 or so years. Uh, we, 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 the inclusionary zoning is a creature of the 1980s, um, and uh, it was uh, an idea that had and uh, has value. But if you actually look at the number of units that were created, it's about 600 units. Uh, and so it hasn't, it, hasn't, it hasn't had the widespread effect that uh, was hoped for. Um, so we have, to, uh, we have to really recommit ourselves to the affordable housing issue um, and inclusionary zoning is certainly uh, a very compelling strategy as a matter of first principle. Um, I do think that we have to be careful about a one-size-fits-all approach because you have different neighborhoods that want different levels of density. Um, obviously, uh, this became very, very clear. Uh, I, I strongly opposed uh, the stadium, uh, but I did support the rezoning of the Hudson Yard area, and we were in extensive negotiations about the exact percentage of affordable housing. And I'm pleased to report that because of the work we did on the city council, the amount of affordable housing has been significantly increased from the mayor's initial, initial proposal. I want to, um, again, thank um, Tom Andari, who's at uh, Hunter College. He's on my extreme left. Tom Agati from Hunter College, thank you so much. Brad Ladner from uh, the Pratt Center, thank you so much. Joshua Carr, thank you very, very much. Brad, it's all yours. Thanks. I'm going to try to be brief, because a, a lot has sort of come on the table, and the, polit the politics of this are changing by the minute. Um, uh, but basically, one, as everybody in the room knows, we've got a sort of a persistent affordable housing crisis in New York City. More than half a million families pay over 50% of their income for rent. 286,000 families that earn less than $18,000 have no Section 8 or other housing subsidy and pay more than half their income for rent. Uh, many of you saw the articles today in the paper about what prices are in Manhattan, in Harlem. Uh, we don't have enough housing, and we especially don't have enough housing that's affordable to the people that, that live and work here. And so that spins out in all kinds of ways with people paying more than they can afford, with doubling up, with moving far outside the city. You know, the most depressing to me in this vein was the articles that were about a year back about the set of folks, mostly from Brooklyn and Queens, mostly Puerto Rican and African Americans who had moved out to the Poconos, you know, several hours from here, uh, gotten fleeced of their money there and tried to commute back to the city every day. So I won't go into it. You know it. You see it in your neighborhoods every day. We go on and on about the details, but there's no question that we have a severe, persistent, now long-standing affordable housing crisis in New York City, and one that's quite different from the one that we had. We had a crisis of abandonment and sort of therefore a lack of affordable housing. Now what we have is uh, remarkable demand fueled by uh, immigration on the one hand and uh, gentrification uh, professionals moving into the city on the, on the other. Uh, of the two, probably a better problem to have, uh, a city too many people want to live in, as opposed to one where no one wants to, but still one that makes it, you know, impossible, really, for working people to find a place to live uh, in neighborhoods of opportunity in the city. Uh, so that's the crisis, you know it well. The Mayor Bloomberg uh, actually has taken some steps to, to try to approach the problem and launched now a couple of years ago their new housing marketplace program, which is a $3 billion commitment to try to preserve or create, uh, well, to create about 21,000 new units, preserve another 40, 45,000 units, of affordable housing with some good elements to it. Not enough, in my estimation, for people with the most need. And 21,000 new units is sort of a drop in the bucket, but still, it's, it, it, is a, it was a meaningful new commitment. What was a little less noticed at the time when, when this plan was put out about two years ago was 
alongside the set of financial programs to subsidize people to encourage them to build and preserve affordable housing was a whole set of neighborhood rezoning and redevelopment initiatives to create more space for people to build housing. Uh, and by now, people are starting to kind of notice them on Hudson, you know, the West Side, Hudson Yards, West Chelsea, Ladies Mile, Sherman Creek, Manhattanville, Greenpoint, Williamsburg, uh, Dumbo, Port Morris in the Bronx, uh, a whole set of sort of, uh, of many neighborhoods where either conversions were proposed from manufacturing to residential or to allow substantial additional density so people could build housing. Um, now, ironically, there's as many or more neighborhoods where the administration is saying, we won't let you build any more housing at all. We're going to down zone Staten Island and Throgs Neck and Bay Ridge and Bensonhurst. And I'll come back to that at the very end. But uh, because that really does constrain the possibilities of housing production in many neighborhoods where people want to live. But the mayor sort of said, in addition to these finance plans, we've got all these rezonings. And when you add them up, those rezonings create the potential for more than 80,000 new units of housing in the generation to come. The problem is that there were, at the beginning, almost no plans to make any of those units affordable. So we really raised this flag of it makes sense to build more housing in New York. We have to create space to build more units to meet the demands that we have. Now, where is appropriate is, a, is another question. We also want to provide some spaces in New York City where we can have blue-collar jobs. But there are plenty of places to rezone to create housing. But it only makes sense if some meaningful chunk of that housing is going to be affordable to people. We're not, the, the, the shortage of, of housing in New York City is so severe that simply building another 50 or 60,000 units is not going to trickle down to ease up the marketplace. The, short, the estimate of our shortage is somewhere between 250 and 500,000 units. And so it only makes sense to create, you know, 80,000 new units if a real chunk of them are going to be affordable to a significant number of New Yorkers and not just for those that can afford to pay the prices of over a million dollars that are... So how do you get that affordability? That was the question. What we did was looked around the country and said, what are people doing when they rezone to create new space for housing to get affordability? And one significant answer, not the only answer, not a panacea, not one that's going to solve all our problems, but an important one is this tool called inclusionary zoning. And that it's a simple concept with a lot of details. And the simple concept is this. We'll let you build more than you would have been able to build if some of it's affordable. Uh, so again, a pretty simple concept. You know, you, you, you were previously allowed to build this much. You can build more than that as long as a chunk of what gets built is affordable. So that's the simple concept. Now, there are instantly many, many details. You know, affordable to whom? You know, what incomes? How many of the units have to be affordable? How big is the density bonus going to be? Can you use subsidy programs? How long are they affordable for? So. Uh, and we go on and on and on at some length, and I'll report about this, and I'm not going to do that tonight. The one detail that I want to talk a little bit about, um, because it's gotten a lot of play and debate and certainly matters, is this question of, is the program mandatory or voluntary? In a mandatory program, you say, okay, we'll let you build more, but now you must include some affordable units. You don't have any choice. In a voluntary program, you say, you can build yay high market rate with no affordable, but you can build this much higher if you include affordable units. So it's a fairly simple difference. And I guess what I believe from all the evidence around the country, there have been sort of five uh, national studies that look at this, is that all the real evidence says to me at least that mandatory programs work better. They produce more units. They do it more certainly. There's no evidence that they actually dampen or harm housing production. They have mandatory programs in Boston, San Diego, San Francisco. None of those cities have seen you know, the bottoms fall out of their housing markets, or really any measurable negative impact. Well, thanks for the uh, wonderful introduction, and it's great to be here. I did migrate about three years over from Brooklyn, where Brad and I uh, were colleagues, and um, and it's and I'm great. To, I'm glad to see you here. I'm also glad that uh, Brad did all the difficult work. He summarized the issue of inclusionary zoning in New York City today in a comprehensive way. What I would like to do is just add uh, a few items to that. Now, I'm a member of the Task Force on Community-Based Planning, which is a coalition of community boards, professionals, um, representatives from community-based organizations, who believe that what we need in the city, more than inclusionary zoning, is community planning. That neighborhoods, communities can work as partners with government 
in developing a future vision for their own neighborhoods. If we had that, it would be a lot easier uh, to have affordable housing in neighborhoods. It would be a lot easier. What we have now is a process of development which is driven by developers. Developers go to City Hall, they say, well, the Brooklyn waterfront is hot, uh, let's rezone it. Well, we want the west side, uh, let's rezone it. And neighborhoods, communities, only get to say yes or no, we're going to fight you or not, because that's the only way they're going to get in to the discussion uh, to begin with in the part of New York City. That's supposed to set the planning agenda. That's supposed to work with communities and neighborhoods and help neighborhoods to form their own priorities. And I can just bet you that if we did that, almost every neighborhood in the city would say, yes, we want affordable housing, and this is how we want it, where we want it. We do want development, but under such conditions. And then the city could work with them as partners. And then the city can go out and find developers who can produce what the neighborhoods want. It's all backwards now. It's all driven by whatever the market will bear. Well, you say, the market is the only thing that can bring us affordable housing. Well, Brad has studied this. I've studied this. I'm looking for the first example where a market unimpeded by government subsidy, without government subsidy, without government regulations that require it, produces uh, uh, low-cost housing for people with modest incomes. Hey, if you were investing in real estate, would you invest in low-income housing? No. You would invest where you can maximize your returns. Now, everywhere else where there is inclusionary zoning, the reason developers don't drop out is because they just change their financial plan to incorporate uh, uh, units for people with modest incomes. It's the cost of doing business. It's part of doing business. The city requires 20 percent, 25, 30 percent, and place, some places it's even more affordable housing. Well, you just include that in your financial plan, and it works out because you're going to make money and you're going to be guaranteed development. But we have a development community that would rather spend five or ten years in court fighting neighborhoods, that would rather, um, uh, you know, plunge ahead without the neighborhoods and take their chances. And not a development community that is prepared to work with neighborhoods from the get-go. Everywhere that I work on, on community plans, people say, yes, we want development. We want the kind of development that's going to enhance the value of our neighborhood uh, and uh, that's going to allow us to continue to stay. We work with neighborhoods who spend years struggling to get investment. And then they're faced with the option that if they do, if, uh, they do get development, they can't afford to stay. That's not right. The city planning department, it's curious, Brad mentioned, why don't they accept inclusionary zoning? City planners all over the country recognize it as an accepted tool. And the argument that we heard first from the city planning department, you want to know why the mayor, mayor's office repeats this argument, because they hear it from the city planners. They say it doesn't work. That's what they've said publicly. It doesn't work. There's absolutely no evidence they present to anybody that it doesn't work. They're, they just reject it out of hand. They ought to be all thrown out. Our uh, last panelist, and then we're going to open this up for a uh, question and answers, is uh, Joshua Carr. And he's the founder of Carr uh, Real Estate Services, a boutique real estate consulting firm. He specializes in market and feasibility studies, financial software training, and financial modeling. He is an adjunct assistant professor at New York University as well as at Baruch College where he teaches real estate finance 
And I think you know where we're going with Joshua. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's, all, okay. it's all yours, Joshua. I know. I know. Uh, growing up in real estate development, uh, you know, we're, we're an industry which is probably a notch below used car sales. Perfectly fine, though. but I went to school with lawyers, so you know they're worse. Too. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll respond to some of the comments Tom and Brad made, and also just throw out some of my own. I'll uh, try not to refer to ad hominem attacks, of course. Um, so we'll see how we do here. Um, I have a few points I want to make just to open up, and obviously we'll then sort of get into a free throw, free flow back and forth. Um, you know, in some places I, I definitely agree with Tom and Brad. Some I don't. Um, you know, the issue of mandatory versus voluntary, uh, to me, it's really kind of a non-issue. I mean, all development is voluntary anyway, so if you put in a mandatory program and say, well, it's mandatory, and then a developer goes, well, I'm not going to build, well, then it's not mandatory, nothing happens. Similarly, if you put together a voluntary program, which is such a bribery of the development community, you're giving them so much that you basically drive up land prices to the point where the only way you could build it is if you use the voluntary program. And to say it's voluntary is also a farce. Essentially, it's mandatory. You can't do the deal otherwise. So the whole mandatory voluntary thing, in my mind, is, is sort of foolish. You know, part of the whole thing of inclusionary zoning and uh, part of the foolishness, in my mind, of even discussing it in New York City is um, we're in a serious housing crisis. I, mean, I don't have to tell any of you that, but just to put it in perspective, we've got 3.2 million units in the city of New York. Of that, we build about 15,000 a year. It's half of 1%. Uh, assuming the economic life of units is somewhat less than 200 years, we're clearly not at replacement rate. Uh, put another way, uh, we're, we're gonna, the situation will just continue to get worse. It's not going to get better from here unless we rapidly and widely boost housing production. Not just affordable housing production, housing production. I mean, it's a very strange situation where in New York City you'll meet someone who's making $150,000, $200,000 a year, and you ask them about what they pay for the rent or whatever, and they start bitching and moaning about how expensive it is. You're like, well, wait a moment. You know, you're easily in, in, you're healthily in the six figures here, but everybody in New York complains about affordable housing. So you put that together with HPD, when Housing Preservation and Development talks about who is worthy of subsidy, they basically say, well, we want to build housing for anyone who's, you know, low income, middle income, anyone up to people making a household income of $100,000 a year. You start to bounce around a number of $100,000 a year for a household anywhere but the five boroughs in New York. Other HPDs or their equivalents in other municipalities would say, well, why are you helping those people? Those people obviously should be able to function in the market. So I don't really see this as to say, well, we're going to take a certain group of people and we're going to give them lower income housing, we're going to give them, you know, a boost. Uh, it's not addressing the larger issue, which is just housing production. You build an 800-foot unit, 800 roughly times 400 bucks a foot, $320,000 to build the unit, then you've got to add on everything else. You can build the same kind of housing, same unit, but instead of building a 30-story high-rise two blocks from here, you can build in the boroughs for the third as much money. So I would say at the least to people who are in favor of inclusionary zoning, okay, you want to build housing for low income, that's great. But you're telling me you'd rather build one unit in a high rise than three units somewhere else where you can build lower rise, somewhere lower density in the boroughs. That to me is deeply offensive. And I'm going to try not to get too emotional here, but it's deeply offensive to me. Because it's basically such a manifestation of saying, well, I'm so concerned about this poor family that they don't get to live in my neighborhood. And there's all kinds of elitist stuff which rolls in there about being around their social betters neo-Victorianism, all kinds of ugly stuff. But I'm so concerned about this one family living in my neighborhood that what I'm going to do is I'm going to deprive two other families from getting any housing whatsoever because I can't bear to build those three units in Brooklyn instead of building one unit in Manhattan. And I'll resist the temptation to kind of go through a, you know, a litany of disagreements with, with Josh's uh, statement. But two areas. One, there is a reason to do it on site. We are not an integrated city. We are a diverse city. We are one of the most segregated big cities in the country. I think we're third behind Detroit and Milwaukee segregation if what you're looking at is do whites and African Americans or white and whites and Latinos live in the same neighborhoods and that's not just like a social Victorian preference our schools are segregated because our neighborhoods are segregated and so our education outcomes are segregated and so people's opportunities are segregated hi uh, my name is Terry Grace uh, I'm I have the great privilege of being on the steering committee of Eastside congregations for housing justice um, 
there, there are several things that we've been concerned about, um, but it goes back to the basics that there is more household, there's faster household creation than housing unit creation in the city, which I think is what Josh was talking about. You cannot play the supply and demand game in this city. It just doesn't work. You've got major rental markets with the price controls and that, that provides affordable housing for all kinds of people. And then we have uh, this ghetto system where the inclusionary zoning is, uh, if you build a high rise in Manhattan, you can throw your, your uh, zoning credits and everything and you go out way to the eastern and southern and northern reaches of the entire city. And that's where your affordable uh, units go. And is that the diversity and is that just housing? Yes. Uh, 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 you can talk to them.